Hello again. For this episode, I've come to the Wittemspalais in Weimar, the Widow's Palace, located on the Theaterplatz in the centre of Weimar. This was a residence for more than 30 years during the classical Weimar period of Anna Amalia of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, who became Duchess when she married Ernst August II Constantine, Duke of Saxe Weimar and Eisenach. She married her Duke in 1756, but he died only two years later, leaving her regent for their infant son, Karl August. She had originated from a family active in cultural matters and accordingly she used her position to act as a patron for both literature and the arts. She transformed the court into what was to become arguably the most significant cultural centre of the Holy Roman Empire, the Athens on the Ilm. She and her son drew many of the most eminent figures of the era to Weimar, despite its small size and limited means, including Herder, Wieland, Goethe, Schiller and others. Duchess Anna Amalia was also a composer. She wrote a symphony for chamber group of wind and strings, and even an opera based on a text by Goethe, none of which I've heard or seen, unfortunately. But it showed her heart was in the right place. Guests and scholars alike were privileged to gather together here to discuss ideas about music and aesthetics in general, and ideas about the nature of ideas themselves. There were many influences that made classical Weimar what it was, including the rise of nationalism in the face of external threats, the Sturm und Drang and then the romantic sentiments of the young seeking a new world order, and also the renewed intrigue with ancient civilizations of the past and their attempts at wider political representation and democracy. However, one of the greatest influences on Weimar society was the work of one man, Immanuel Kant, and in particular his three critiques. It was he who launched the project of German idealism. Kant laid out his inquiry as early as his Essay on Diseases of the Mind in 1764 and spent his entire life's work, including the writing of his three critiques, trying to explain the psychological processes underpinning both radicalization and its milder version, belief. This for him was the very nature of the Enlightenment project and this building is where these ideas were taken up and pulled apart. According to Reed, Kant's transcendental idealism argues that any perceiving agents must have their own perceptual and conceptual equipment, and it's that which blocks an absolute reality from view. An unconditional reality can be conceived but not perceived. It's necessary by definition. Reed added that Kant's whole argument boils down to a revolutionary tautology. Human beings can only know what human beings can know. This is the festival hall, the ballroom. It's beautiful. Duchess Anna Amalia acquired this building after a devastating fire made her palace uninhabitable. She put a great deal of work into decorating it, and there are many oil paintings and watercolours and busts representing various members of the ducal family and other respected guests that visited here. It would have been a meaningful backdrop to discussion about Kant's critique of pure reason, which he wrote in 1781. Kant argued that there were limits to what can be known about the world. He reasoned that the human mind could never determine foundational knowledge or fundamental laws of nature, in part because such things cannot be established empirically, as have been demonstrated by David Hume and the empiricists, and also because rationalism, as demonstrated by Leibniz and Wolff, was constrained by the mind itself by its aptitude for formulating modes of sensibility, such as the conceptual parameters of external space and internal time, and methods of judgment, such as the conceptual fundamentals of substance, causality and unity. Kant argued that the mind is not a simple receptacle gathering data from the senses. The sensory input of sight and hearing requires processing by the mind to create mental images. Thereafter, these images are not the same as the things they represent. The thought of a tree or a chandelier is not the same thing as a chandelier. And there has to be some processing function that turns the experienced image into a mental image. 
Robert Richards wrote, As a result of urging by his friend, the poet Friedrich Schiller, Goethe became grudgingly convinced of the Kantian epistemology, which seemed to block access to the real world. Kant had argued that the apparent correlation between mental concepts and objects in the world is not a real one, whereby mental concepts can be seen to mirror reality. It's the other way around. Reality conforms to the concepts created by the human mind. In formal terms, I can say, it is the case that P is true, even only if P conforms to transcendental norms is true. Kant called this a Copernican revolution of the mind, similar to Copernicus's revolution of the solar system. Instead of seeing the Earth at the centre of things, astronomy had revealed the suns at the centre. Similarly, instead of placing reality at the centre, whereby objects are object objectively situated and perceived by a mind looking on, the mind is placed at the centre. The mind, without being conscious of what it's doing, creates the appearance of reality by way of its cognitive structures. Kant argued that all cognitive experience is a consequence of the mind's structure and not a simplistic representation of the things in themselves. For instance, the perception of spatio-temporal conditions is defined by forms of cognition rather than by actual attributes of space and time. Kant argued that it was not possible for the mind to have knowledge of the noumenal world, the reality of things beyond the mind. The human mind could only ever experience the phenomenal world. Shadows of the noumenal world could be seen in the existence of a noumenal self, but otherwise reality was unknowable. Kant's idealism made the scepticism of David Hume, who doubted regularity could be established as natural law, invalid. Hume and other empiricists had posited that if there are a thousand white swans on a lake, it didn't imply for certain that the next swan to arrive would also be white. And the same principle held true for all knowledge of the world. Nothing was certain except the need for scepticism. Kant disagreed. He said the notions of certainty and uncertainty were themselves human constructs, fashioned in a manner that was beyond the control of the individual. It couldn't be known beyond those constructs if certainty and uncertainty existed as things in themselves. The epistemological limits to knowledge did not allow for such knowledge. Nevertheless, even if knowledge was constrained, the human mind still had the potential to know and understand a great deal, far more than the empiricists and rationalists had realised, by way of subject-predicate propositions, and also synthetic a priori knowledge. This is Kant's principle of how the sensibility of human perception and thinking work together to create the logical structure of experience. Propositions are synthetic in the sense they're based on experience of the world. Thereafter, they're subject to mediation, which gives them coherence by way of a priori analyticity. Here's an example. I see an apple fall from a tree, and then another, and then another. And in the end, I have relational knowledge based on experience that apples fall from trees. And thereafter, apply the faculty of imaginative mediation to this and realise that apples always fall from trees. In addition to relational cognition, Kant said that conjunctions like this can also be used to define quantitative concepts, such as unity, plurality and totality, qualitative concepts, such as the notions of reality, absence and negation, and of modality, such as notions of necessity and possibility, which I'll also look at in a later episode. This is a painting room, a good place to consider another example pertaining to causality. If I see my son listening to music and also he's tapping his foot, and then I say he's tapping his foot as a result of listening to music, then my statement is not based upon something I've seen. I haven't seen with my eyes that there's a connection between the two, that he's tapping his foot as a result of listening to music. It's a determination of causality I've made schematically. My understanding of the music having caused the foot tapping is based both on experience and mediation. 
It's synthetic a priori. In the introduction to his Critique of Pure Reason, Kant gave another example of this. He said that the straight line between two points is the shortest is a synthetical proposition. For my concept of straight contains nothing of magnitude, quantity, but a quality only. The concept of the shortest is, therefore, purely adventitious, i.e. additional, and cannot be deduced from the concept of the straight line by any analysis whatsoever. One of the most far-reaching implications of this is to reveal how people can be so easily misguided in their rationalizations, especially when the faculty of reason takes over. They see a tree, and then another tree, and learn that it's a tree, but are still able to rationalize it's something other than a tree, perhaps an evil spirit or perhaps a message from the gods. Kant says knowledge is not based only on phenomenal experience, but is a product of a multitude of other factors and able to justify all kinds of beliefs. He warns that although reason can be used constructively to bring higher unity to the understanding of concepts, it can also create illusory ideas, transcendental illusion. Theologians quickly realised the implications of what was involved, even if Kant was too polite to say it explicitly. Denying the radicalised madman justification for his absolutism also implies the mild-mannered religious person cannot have any genuine knowledge of God, or purpose, or even of morality. Reason enables people to postulate the world, the soul, and the divine, but it doesn't enable them to know if those things are real. According to Kant, all absolutism is debunked. This is a dining room, the so-called round table room. This was the room that the Duchess used as a main venue for social events. There would have been a sense of relief in the room when in 1788 Kant wrote his critique of practical reason and argued that although there were limits to knowledge, this did not mean that humans should consider themselves doomed to ignorance. Quite the opposite. And although the mind constructed reality in a way that was beyond the control of the individual, this did not imply humans were trapped in a mechanistic world they could not control. He argued that humans possessed the faculties of free will and moral judgment, and that these acted autonomously. They were not predetermined. Kant argued that the spirit of the Enlightenment required a confidence to think autonomously, free of established modes of convention and authority. He recognised that it had been traditional religion that had previously posited a sense of reason and purpose underlying the tragedies of a contingent world. If circumstances seemed unwarranted and unjust, ultimately, events and situations were all part of some hidden divine plan. Everything happened with the best of intentions. Life was directed by the enigma of celestial providence. But the Enlightenment, and his work in particular, had removed the prop of heavenly consolation. Kant recognised that if the notion of a divine world controlling events was to be replaced with a sense of reverence for the natural world, then humanity had to take it upon themselves to work towards creating the good. Such standards are hard to achieve and Kant was not naive about the practicality of such standards. Nevertheless, he was an optimist. Kant said humanity must aspire to a free and civil society operating in the context of a free and civil international order that was the work of the best efforts of humankind. Kant's alternative approach to ethics is deontological. It's based upon the notions of duty and responsibility. But Kant took it a stage further. He said a person doesn't just act in a way he wants others to act towards himself, but that all people must act in a way they want everybody else to. Kant called this the categorical imperative. It's not a kindness to help others in distress. It's not to be considered a moral act. It's a requirement. Reason itself justifies such behaviour. Being a human by definition requires acting with humanity. In other words, we don't push in front of others in line because if everybody did the same, there would be no line left to push in front of. 
We don't tell lies and fabrications to others because if everybody did the same, the entire drapery of society would collapse in a heap of torn fabric. This is the Green Salon, which was once the Duchess's living room. The decor represents a classical style which would have appealed to Goethe when it had private audiences with the Duchess and when he discussed the Critique of Judgment, published in 1790. Kant had recognised there was still much to be explained about how the mental facilities of reason and judgment connected with one another, and he sought to address these issues by analysing aesthetical and teleological judgments. Kant argued that the faculty of reason, based on transcendental sensibility and moral action, and the faculty of judgment interact in a state of free play. He posited that the greatest human expression comes through art and music, which is best suited to achieve the highest states of reconciliation between the physical determinism of the transcendent and the human freedom of judgment. But he also argued that the essence of ascetic experience did not involve emotions or judgments about what is beautiful or ugly or tragic or comic, but is disinterested. He was not concerned with the rules and principles of art or those pertaining to the art world, but the qualitative nature of experience itself. It's not that the colour green, for instance, is determined to be subjectively pleasant, Transcendental idealism posits that the experience of green in itself is an ascetic experience. Here he's looking back to the ancient Greek usage of the word ascetics to refer directly to the immediate faculty of sense perception. His transcendental ascetic then is the procedural operations of the mind that enable the conceptualization of sense perception. But he took a step further by suggesting aesthetic judgments are also able to reveal teleology. Kant said that people are able to determine, by way of phenomenal experience, a sense of purpose in the natural world. In the same way that the actions of an artist or a music composer in creating their work are purposive, bringing their art to reality so as to realise a preconceived vision, so conceptual understanding, according to Kant, perceives the same purposiveness in the world as a whole by way of aesthetics. Kant tried to describe this by looking to biology. He said that individual components of an animal's anatomy exist so as to contribute something to end requirements. The bird's wing doesn't exist only for its own sake. It has strong muscles so it can carry a bird on the wind. The heart exists not just for itself, but for its role in the body. It has a purpose. Each part is designed by the whole. I should add right away that this is a very different argument compared to that made by current day intelligent design theists, who also look to teleology. They argue that God designs nature, which is different to Kant, who left God and any kind of absolute reality out of the picture. He argued that nature designs nature, and in particular its component parts. And his main reason for making the argument was to illustrate mental cognition. The human mind, in the process of adding a priori analyticity to raw experiences, distinguishes a sense of purpose in the world. The mind perceives things happening as a means to an end. I should also add that modern science theory rejects the notion of teleology altogether. It's a common misperception among those same intelligent design theists that natural selection is subject to refutation because it's based on natural law, but it's not. It's a logical phenomena based entirely on statistics. I'll look at how it works in a later episode when I consider modern views about the laws of nature. But as regards Kant, there could be no separation between what exists in perception, a result of the mind, and what exists in nature. He re-emphasised that people could never see the world other than as people. Any real world beyond human cognitive capacity, any notions of bird wings or hearts, would always be especially impenetrable because it was beyond human cognitive capacity. Before I finish, let me summarise all of this and try to characterise what Kant's theories meant to the discussions held in the Wittemspalais. Previously, in the early 17th century, Descartes had argued that the universe comprises of two universes, or two substances, side by side. 
there's the mental world on one side and the physical world on the other. Clearly an image in the mind of a tree is not the same thing as a tree and, by way of introspection, Descartes had concluded that the mental image and the real thing are of different domains, different essences, or as he put it, different substances. His successors were enthralled at this mind-body theory, but they were disappointed that this Cartesian dualism didn't say anything about the interaction between the two substances. Even if they're independent worlds, clearly there's some level of connection between the two. Objects and events in the physical world affect the mental world, and vice versa. The solution to the problem had come with the development of science and Newtonian mechanics. It was said that Descartes was wrong. There are not two worlds. There's only one, the physical realm. There's no such thing as a mental realm. The mind is a mechanistic apparatus, just like the planets and moons are also mechanistic. If all of nature is a machine, then so is a human brain. Newtonian science had posited interactions between the mind and the brain were explained simply by the fact they were both a part of the same machine. This was a prevailing paradigm throughout the 18th century until Kant's critiques. Kant said, it's true there's only one world, not two as proposed by Descartes. But science had got it the wrong way round. They needed a dose of their own Copernican reversals. Existence is not exclusively physical. Existence is exclusively mental. That's to say, perceptions of reality are created by the mind itself and not as a result of a so-called reality. The real world, if there is such a thing, can never be known. The young people of classical Weimar and nearby romantic Jena were energised by this vision. Life is not a machine without purpose and meaning. Life is transcendent autonomy and the freedom of self-expression and powerful literature and music. Life is organic and endlessly flourishing and, with the right heart and mind, oriented on great things. The future was bright. I'd like to finish with another section from the piece that started this episode, my concerto for marimba and chamber orchestra, Solar Rites. Thanks for listening. Thank you.